you very much for inviting me here today and thank you everyone for coming. Um, the topic of my presentation today is the constitutional right to privacy in India. Um, and I'm going to uh, address four main themes um, in my talk today. Um, the first is I'll begin with a brief discussion about the history and the evolution of how the right to privacy in India evolved. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about the development of the right pre the Puttaswami decision. Um, I will then, of course, talk about the August 2017 nine judge bench decision of the Supreme Court of India in Puttaswami before finally concluding with some very preliminary thoughts um, on the interaction with the, between the right to privacy and the right to freedom of speech. Um, so let me begin with the historical background. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but um, I'll just quickly put it out there again. Yeah. Now, the development of the right to privacy in India has had a rather circuitous history. It's evolved almost entirely through judicial decision making. We've had uh, more than about 25 judgments by the Supreme Court of India uh, sprawling over 60 years. Um, however, most of these decisions have lacked consistency, um, some in terms of their evolution and some in terms of uh, specific privacy themes that uh, the decisions have teased out. Um, it began in 1954 when there was an eight judge bench decision of the Supreme Court of India in MP Sharma. That was the first instance that the Supreme Court was called upon to consider whether a separate right to privacy existed at all within the confines of the Indian Constitution or not. Um, and in that instance, the court was examining a case which considered the constitutional validity of search and seizures in the Indian context. And on that instance, the court desisted from recognizing a constitutional right to privacy within the confines of the fundamental rights chapter. Um, this continued in 1963 in Karak Singh, which was a six judge bench, the majority at least, in part resonated with the reasoning um, in MP Sharma. Um, it was nearly uh, two decades later, in about the early 70s, um, where privacy was first discussed within very narrow confines in Malkani, before finally being discussed um, very tentatively in Govind. The right there was discussed in a very hypothetical sense. So the court literally said that, assuming there is a right to privacy, this is possibly how the contours of that right would evolve. Um, and then it was from the mid-90s that we had a series of about 20 decisions that consistently seemed to recognize and affirm this right to privacy. And they, in some ways, appeared to develop the right in a systematic sense. And then, of course, cut to 2017, we had a nine-judge bench which was constituted to re-adjudicate the very contours and the very existence of the right. The question before that uh, bench was whether a right to privacy existed at all in the Indian context or not. That's really all I want to say about the history. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the development of how privacy developed as a constitutional right pre puttaswami before going on to talk about post puttaswami Now, prior to puttaswami as I said, there were about more than 25 decisions. Um, it was sprawled about five or six decades where this right was recognized. Um, and I think there are certain trends which appeared to emerge even pre puttaswami um, I think the most interesting trend among all of those um, concerned the standard of judicial review that was applicable to privacy cases. And most of the privacy cases prior to Puttaswami appeared to oscillate between two standards of judicial review. Uh, the first, of course, was the traditional reasonableness standard of just, fair, and reasonable, tenable under Article 21. But the court also appeared to test certain privacy cases against the stricter standard of scrutiny of compelling state interest, which some of the co uh, court's decisions had loosely borrowed from American jurisprudence. Now, there was little to say in this instance which standard applied in what factual matrix and when. Um, another trend, I think, which emerged pre puttaswami was that the right to privacy could be meaningfully classified into different categories. Now, there was some semblance of this in some of the decisions pre puttaswami um, but even just looking at most of the factual case, uh, the factual matrix that uh, emerged in most of the cases, the Indian Supreme Court was grappling with cases that concerned um, search and seizures, surveillance, telephone tapping, flow of information, abortion, rights of transgenders, narco-analysis, among many others. And it's difficult to escape the conclusion that these cases concerned very different conceptions of privacy and not privacy as a unitary conception. Um, this was reaffirmed in Puttaswami, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, another word of classification, many authors have attempted to classify the right to privacy in the literature on defining and classifying privacy, and they use various methods for classifying. Um, the, uh, for classifying the right to privacy in general. Elsewhere, I have argued that the right to privacy in India can be meaningfully classified into at least three distinct categories. I call them physical privacy, informational privacy, and decisional privacy. And some part of this has been reaffirmed um, in Puttaswami as well. Um, there's one other trend that I want to quickly uh, touch upon. Um, pre 
Shri Swami, and that really concerns um, how the right to privacy operates. So does it operate in a vertical and horizontal manner? And I'll explain conceptually what this means in a moment. But um, essentially, prior to Puntuswami, most of the privacy cases applied uh, in um, an instance where the right was tenable only against the state, except two Supreme Court decisions and one High Court decision. And I'll come back to that. Um, let's move on then to Puntuswami itself. Um, now, most of you, I'm sure, are aware about the background facts that gave rise to Puntuswami, but I'll quickly remind, remind them here for you. Um, so since early 2015, the government of India was trying to push forward the Aadhaar card scheme as an omnipresent uh, card scheme. This is essentially a mass data collection scheme which was based on biometric and demographic collection of data. Now the validity of the scheme was challenged among several other grounds on the basis that it violates the right to privacy. Interestingly, the government's response was not to argue that the scheme was a reasonable or a proportionate restriction on the right, but was to challenge the existence of the very right to privacy. Mr. Mukul Rohadgi, who was then our attorney general, very famously sort of stood up in the Supreme Court of India and said that there is no right to privacy in India recognized within the confines of the Constitution. And he was able to make this argument because of uh, an inconsistency which allegedly existed in the precedents. Uh, we talked about M.P. Sharma just now. And they were still able to rely on the 1954-8 judge bench decision in M.P. Sharma, which they argued was still binding. Therefore, a nine judge bench had to be constituted to reconsider whether this right existed at all or not. Um, as Mr. Gandhi said, the nine judge bench handed down six separate concurring opinions. It's uh, been a little more than a year now. On 24th of August 2017, we had this decision. The judgment's nearly about 550 pages long. And there are very significant implications that have come out of this judgment, both for constitutional law in India in general, and specifically for the right to privacy. We've seen, I think, um, one of the implications earlier this week with the Nafteen Singh decision. Um, now, I'm interested in looking at uh, this decision purely from a privacy uh, lens, and I think there are certain privacy themes that particularly jump out post Puttaswami, and I'll very briefly touch upon those. And I think the first theme that jumps out is, uh, as I talked about um, earlier, the idea that privacy is not a monolithic conception, so that it is essentially uh, better understood as a right which has uh, different variants. Um, now, we've seen hints of this prior to Puttaswami, and I think the Supreme Court has now conclusively confirmed this view. This is because um, there is unanimity among all the judges that the right operates through different variants, but what there isn't unanimity on is what exactly these variants are. Um, I'll very quickly take you through the uh, separate speeches. Uh, Justice Chandrasekhar uh, offers a very learned and a very detailed opinion on various uh, ways to classify this right and what the various variants could be. But when he concludes, for his part, he says that he chooses not to embark on an exhaustive enumeration of what the privacy categories are. Um, Justice Nariman expresses a clear review. He thinks that uh, the right to privacy specifically entails uh, physical privacy, informational privacy, and the privacy of choice. Um, interestingly, in reaching this conclusion, um, his reasoning is reminiscent of privacy jurisprudence in the United States because he goes on to say that these distinct variants of privacy are, they derive support from different constitutional safeguards, which is very much the case in the US, where privacy stands out of uh, 14th Amendment is considered the home of decisional privacy, 4th Amendment is certain seizures, which is more physical privacy and the like. Um, Justice Chalmeshwar, on the other hand, discusses privacy of repose, sanctuary, and intimate decision which is um, Gary Boswick's uh, classification of privacy. Um, the second theme I think that jumps out from privacy is about the standards of judicial review, and I think this is really important because um, this is going to be the standard against which all privacy infractions going forward will be tested. Now, there are three speeches in Puttaswami, that of Justices Chalmeshwar, Sapre, and Bobde, which appear to hint towards some version of the erstwhile compelling state interest test. However, Importantly, it appears to be the case that in Puttaswami, there is a shift in trend towards standard of review. It appears that the court is now hinting towards the standard of proportionality review, which up until um, Puttaswami had never been applied to privacy cases in the Indian context. Um, however, um, I have argued that uh, the plurality of opinions in Puttaswami do not offer a majority view on what the standard of review is. And this is mostly because of Justice Chandrachul's speech. So he wrote for himself and three other judges. Justice Call, uh, on the one hand, is very clear about what proportionality review is, and he adopts the wholesale European Union sense of proportionality uh, review. But Justice Chandrasekhar is less clear, and this is because although he says in so many words that proportionality is the standard for privacy cases going forward, um, it's not clear what he means by proportionality review. 
Uh, now, in most common law jurisdictions, proportionality refers to a standard of review that's higher and distinct from traditional reasonableness. But it's not clear from Justice Chandrachul's judgment whether he actually means to affirm the higher standard or he's actually referring to traditional reasonableness. Um, for the purposes of clarity, proportionality um, essentially consists of four inquiries. The first question that a court needs to ask is, um, is the state pursuing a legitimate purpose? And that's quite clear in Justice Chandrachul's speech. The second question is, is there a nexus between this purpose and the infringing act? And that seems to come across as well. The third question you ask is, uh, can an other less intrusive measure be used to achieve the state purpose? Which also appears to come through in Justice Chandrachul's speech, but it's the last limb, and perhaps arguably the most important limb of the proportionality analysis, which asks the question, is, there, um, is the infringement of the right too great in comparison to the public purpose that is sought to be achieved? which I think does not come through in Justice Chandrachul's decision. And this last limb is often known as the balancing exercise in proportionality review, and that's considered um, characteristic of proportionality review. Um, and I'll come back to this in just a moment uh, when I speak about the interaction between freedom of speech and the right to privacy as well. Um, and I think a final important theme that also jumps out from Puttaswamy is about horizontality. So what does horizontal application mean? Horizontal application essentially refers to applying a constitutional right as between two private parties. Now in the Indian uh, constitutional setup, um, it's quite clear that there are certain articles of the constitution that apply in a directly horizontal manner. Um, articles 23, 52, and some others. Um, but as far as Article 21 is concerned, which is the sole repository of the right to privacy, so far, uh, it seems to be the position that the court has consistently held that this right applies in a vertical manner. So it, um, the right holder is generally a private individual, but the duty bearer against whom the right is claimed is always a state or its instrumentality. Um, so the question now is, does the right to privacy apply in a similar vertical manner? So is it tenable only against the state? Or can you claim a right to privacy when a private individual also infringes your privacy? Now to be clear, Puttaswamy offers no majority view on this. Um, Justice Chandrachud, in his opinion, thinks uh, he doesn't offer very much of horizontality. He actually thinks that this question to decide how privacy would operate between state and non-state actors is best left to the legislature. Uh, Justice Chetmeshwar, on the other hand, um, took the view that this question was beyond the scope of the reference before the court. However, we have two judges, uh, Justices Bobde and Justice Call, um, who appear to occupy very different ends of the spectrum. Now, Justice Bobde offers a clear analysis of horizontality, and his analysis is to reject direct horizontal application of the right. So he says that there is a clear distinction between the common law right to privacy and a uh, distinction between the fundamental right to privacy. Um, according to him, the nature and the content of these rights could interact and could be similar, but the remedy and the forum where you seek this right is very different. Justice Call, on the other hand, uh, has actually come down in uh, favor of direct horizontal application of the right. He has adopted the European Union uh, model, and he um, has gone on to say that the fundamental right is tenable against state and non-state actors. He also expands the scope of this right, not just to the inner sphere of an individual, but also to autonomous life choices. So to him, the right to privacy in all its variants operates in a directly horizontal manner. Um, now, that's really all the themes I wanted to tease out today from Puttaswamy. I'll speak very briefly um, to conclude about um, how I think the right to privacy could possibly interact with the right to freedom of speech. Um, and I have to start with a caveat that I have very preliminary thoughts to offer on this interplay. But I think that these two rights uh, can interact in at least two broad ways. Um, one is a relationship where they complement each other, and the second is a relationship where they are in conflict with each other. Um, I think the way the rights could complement each other is again twofold. Um, for one, we have seen um, in, uh, in a strand of privacy decisions where um, some benches have interpreted privacy as a traveling right or a penumbral right. Um, and in that instance, they consider the freedom of speech as one of the many rights from which an independent right to privacy emanates. So freedom of speech is one of the rights from which the right to privacy um, is interpreted as an independent right. Um, the second way um, in which they complement each other is very interesting, and it actually again comes out of Puttaswamy. Um, you can find this in Justice Bogte's speech, and I think he offers a very interesting lens to look at this interplay from. Um, now, Justice Bogte, when he's talking about the rationales or the values that the right to privacy protects, um, offers um, a very clear exposition of these values. He says that uh, privacy uh, protects innate dignity and the autonomy of uh, man. 
So to him, these are the rationales or the values that the right to privacy is protecting. However, he goes one step further, and he actually suggests that privacy, uh, that privacy is such an innate part of the fundamental rights chapter in the Indian Constitution that other freedoms cannot be recognized without privacy. And I'll quote a passage um, from paragraph 261 of Justice Bogdi's speech, where he actually says that privacy constitutes the basic irreducible condition necessary for the exercise of personal liberty and freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. So to him, privacy is not just an end um, in itself, but it's also a means to achieving something else, and in this case, the exercise of other fundamental rights. Now, interestingly, for the interplay between freedom of speech, he actually goes on to elucidate this very clearly in the context of freedom of speech. He says that privacy in all its con uh, in all its aspects constitutes the springboard for the exercise of the freedoms guaranteed under Article 191. Freedom of speech and expression is always dependent on the capacity to think, read and write in private, and is often exercised in a state of privacy to the exclusion of those not intended to be spoken to or communicated with. So to him, freedom, uh, pri right to privacy is an enabler for the right to uh, freedom of speech to be enjoyed in full. And that's, I think, a very interesting and nuanced way to look at it from. Um, the second point I had was about how these rights conflict with each other. Um, and um, it's very uh, common uh, in the UK to see this conflict between the freedom of speech um, and the right to privacy. Um, and uh, I mean, Article 8, which protects the right to privacy in the European Convention of Human Rights, um, is often uh, at play with Article 10, which guarantees the freedom uh, of expression. Um, and I think most of the cases in the UK, at least, where this uh, conflict arises um, is, uh, are instances where a media house has published uh, some information about a celebrity, for instance, um, and it has the potential to infringe the right to privacy. So the question here is often, is the privacy of a celebrity uh, infringed? Um, and this is where the fourth level of proportionality comes in to balance both the rights. So you have the value of the right to privacy on the one hand, which is balanced um, against uh, the public purpose uh, and the importance of publishing uh, certain information which is arguably true about a certain uh, celebrity. Now in India, uh, this interplay has not been very common in privacy cases, but I think we've all talked about the decision of Raj Gopal, where um, this interplay has clearly um, starkly come about. Now, Raj Gopal, if many of you are probably aware, was a case which considered um, the violation of the privacy of a prisoner whose alleged autobiography was being published by a private media uh, publishing company. Now this is a very interesting case because Raj Gopal is one of the few privacy cases where the court applied the right in a horizontal manner. So the media house here was a private entity. The prisoner, of course, was a private entity. The constitutional right was applied as between both of them. Um, and I think this is very interesting because I, the more I think about it, I don't see how the right to privacy and the freedom of speech can interplay with each other unless and until the right to privacy applies in a directly horizontal manner. Now this is because Article 191A is available only to citizens, and Article 21 is available only to persons. What the definition of a person is arguable, but neither right is available to the state. And I know we talked about public individuals uh, as state, but it's still not available to the state. And it's tenable, uh, both of these rights are tenable against the state. Given this, I think that unless the right to privacy applies horizontally, the interplay will not arise, because it will lead to the situation where if I'm claiming my right to privacy against the government, um, and they are alleging a right to publish, that it will not arise, it will only arise in an instance where I am claiming a right to privacy and the other entity has the right to publish. Um, that's really all I wanted to leave you with. Thank you, Anne.